Let's be in church. Amen. Okay, take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. And we'll finish up, Lord willing, chapter 5 today and possibly start chapter 6. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5, we'll start in verse 6 down to verse 13. We'll read that first and then go back and comment. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or, co or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Let's go out of the world. <laughs> but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Father, may the Holy Spirit bear witness to the word this morning and open the eyes of the simple. Give us understanding, Lord. The entrance of thy word giveth light. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, now in the text it says your glorying is not good. Now this church, the glorying that they had was a, uh, they, were, they thought they were very spiritual. They would stand here and they'd say, well, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. This church that thought they were so spiritual is the church that focused so much on the gifts. Uh, they spoke in tongues. They had all these emphasis on gifts, but yet they knew hardly anything. And they were very carnal in their practices. So that's, a, that's something very important to take note of. Uh, when you get into the next chapter, in chapter 6, I notice that there's 15 question marks in that chapter. And I'm noticing as I'm going through studying 1 Corinthians, he's asking them a lot of questions like, didn't you know this? Didn't you know that? For a church who claimed to be so spiritual and have these gifts, they are the most carnal bunch of baby Christians you've ever ran across who don't know anything. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Keep in mind, beware of a church who claims to be spiritual and have all these gifts like tongues and healings. And beware, beware, 1 Corinthians is your book to help you handle that stuff. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. A little leaven, a little leaven. So it didn't take much. This is obvious. By, if you read the rest of the chapter, or the rest of the book, you can see that they let a little leaven in, and it just leavened the whole entire uh, church there. Verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. Get rid of it. Get it out. That ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So get rid of the old leaven so we can be a new lump as ye are unleavened. And then it says Christ is sacrificed. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now I'll take your Bible and go over to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Hebrews 10. And I want to show you that Jesus doesn't need to be sacrificed again. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, that's Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So what? You, what? you thought you had to sacrifice Jesus Christ every Sunday? You, well, you didn't know that he made one sacrifice uh, for sins and that was it? See, if I'm using the same uh, manner that Paul presents to the Corinthians, there's a lot of people who think that the Mass, when they take the Eucharist and they take the cup, that that is a sacrifice. That's what they call it. It's a sacrifice, and the priest is making another sacrifice again every week. You don't have to make another sacrifice. Look at Hebrews 10 and verse 11, uh, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, not numerous sacrifices every Sunday, one sacrifice for sin sat down on the right hand of God. So Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So you don't have to sacrifice him again and again and again. Verse 8, there of 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The only feast that's mentioned in this uh, book would be the Lord's Supper. 
Let, therefore, let us keep the feast. That's the feast we're supposed to keep. We don't have to keep the Passover because Christ is our Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And as I already showed you, leaven in the Bible is, a ty is uh, typed as malice and wickedness here in a text. It's also as the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 16, verse 12, as false doctrine in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, and as hypocrisy in Luke chapter 12, and verse 1. All right, now notice in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Now, an epistle is a letter, and I'll show you how you know that. Go to 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 7. So when in doubt, just compare Scripture with Scripture, and then you'll start to understand what words mean. So the one thing about the King James Bible is it has a built-in dictionary. And the more you familiarize yourself with it, the more you read it, the more you'll start to learn and understand what the words are. So an epistle. So that's not something that I use in my everyday speech when I'm, so I'm going to write you an epistle. I wouldn't say that, but I might say I'm going to write you a letter. Now in 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 7 verse, um, I think it's 9, uh, verse 8. 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 8. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter... So notice he made you sorry with a letter. I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. So you see how in the beginning of the verse, he made him sorry with a letter, and then he tells him that an epistle is what made him sorry. So epistle is a letter. You see how we just did that? We just figured out what it meant by taking the scripture and comparing it. So you don't have to throw out the, your King James Bible to get a, something else that you feel is easier to understand. Just stick with the King James Bible. You'll be all right. Pray that the Holy Spirit guides you and gives you the wisdom, and then you'll be able to uh, figure it out. Now, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Now, for those of you that need a more modern, up-to-date version, a fornicator is uh, basically what's paraded upon the, 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 scene, the, 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 the media, uh, all your, uh, your, your movies, your, your, your YouTube, all that, though, that, just a bunch of fornication. Uh, so they call this premarital sex. They make this, uh, they doctor it up. They, make, they try to make it sound nice. But the Bible doesn't try to make sin sound nice. Uh, 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 it's consensual. It doesn't try to make it sound, it just calls it what it is. In a generation who wants to call things what they are, they sure don't. Uh, it, the Bible calls them fornicators. That's what it calls it. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Now this is real important. So he tells them not to keep company with fornicators. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with covetous or, or extortioners or with idolaters, for them must you needs go out of the world. So you're at your job. You're at your job, right? <laughs> How are you going to stay away from the fornicators and the covetous and the extortioners and the idolaters at your job? How are you going to do that? <laughs> How are you going to stay away from them when you go to the grocery store? How are you going to stay? You, it's, you can't stay away from them. They're everywhere. However, you shouldn't be, uh, the idea is, is that you're not, they're not buddy-buddy and, and palling around with them. But now the Lord makes it very clear. He makes it very clear what, uh, what he's talking about. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. All right, so if you're called a brother, what are you not supposed to do? If any man be called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. So don't have fellowship with this guy. Don't even eat with him. Now, you know what a fornicator is. You know what covetous is. That's wanting something that you, that, uh, that's not yours, uh, not being content with what you have. Now, you can be content. Go over to Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews 13. So one of the, ten, the last of the Ten Commandments deals with covetousness, not, uh, not to cover your, your neighbor's uh, house, his ox, his wife, not to covet those things. Hebrews 13 and verse uh, 4 says, Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Coming right on the heels of telling you to, uh, that, that the uh, physical part of marriage is, uh, uh, is only to be contained within marriage, he then says in verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness. And boy, I tell you what, we live in a society where, where uh, everyone is coveting their neighbor's wife or their neighbor's husband. They just covet all sorts of things, covetousness. Let, uh, let they, they covet uh, uh, the technology. They covet not to have to work. They covet, uh, they covet that, to have it easier just like somebody else does. They covet money, they, uh, every, they, all sorts of things. They'll covet gifts that somebody has or abilities that someone has. I mean, you just name it, they're, they're endless. Let your covered conversation be without covetousness. 
and be content with such things as you have. So the opposite of covetousness is contentment. Are you content? <laughs> the opposite of covetousness is contentment. You know what else the Bible says covetousness is? It's idolatry. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. All right, so why can a Christian be, be content? Be content with such things as you have. For, so now he's about ready to tell you why you can do it. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now think about that. You got the Lord Jesus Christ who said he would never leave thee nor forsake thee. So because you have him, you can be content. Amen. You can be content. Amen. All right, back here in the text in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. So if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, you know what that is, or an idolater. Now you may not have uh, idols in your house, but you might have them in your heart. Uh, you ever put your spouse above the Lord? I mean, if your spouse wanted something and God wanted something else, would you go with what your spouse said or would you go with what the Lord said? Uh, do you ever put your kids uh, above the Lord? If your kids decided they didn't want to come to this church anymore and you knew God wanted you at this church, would you leave and go to some other church? Would you put your kids above the Lord, what the Lord's will is? Um, how about your own desires? Would you put your own desires above, uh, above the Lord? Uh, you know, it, there's all sorts of things that are idols. The Bible talks about setting up idols in your heart. You made an idol out of education. Uh, if you pursue an educate, make an idol out of it. You make an idol out of your own smarts. Think, man, I'm, I'm smart. I got this book. No, I'm pretty intelligent. Yeah. You know, the Bible says about our brain, right? <laughs> the Bible says about the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Yeah. God, you wanna, if you want to be wise, you got to become a fool. Yeah. That's what you got to do. Uh, what have you done? Have you put your pastor above the Lord? Have you put your, your own feelings above? What is it that you've put above the Lord? It's an idol. It's an idol. You know, we're supposed to take our will and make it subservient to the Lord. And, and there's times where if the Lord, the, the, big, the biggest test is are you willing to do what you don't want to do, but you will do it because He wants you to do it. That's a big test. All right, back in the text, or an idol, uh, an idolater, sorry, or a railer. Now, a railer is one who scoffs, insults, reproaches with reproachful language. Just saying really bad things about uh, people. I'll give you an example of someone who railed. 2 Chronicles 32, 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Chronicles 32. And verse 17, 2 Chronicles 32, 17. He wrote also, uh, he, this is uh, Hezekiah talking about Sennacherib, he wrote also, and he's praying to the Lord about this, he wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel. How is he railing on the Lord God of Israel? And to speak against him. That's what railing is, to speak against him. Saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. That's railing against the Lord, that's speaking against the Lord, and it's false. It's false. God will truly, God delivered uh, uh, the, his people out of Sennacherib's hand. God's on Israel's side. Uh, sometimes God will, bring, God will bring a nation in to invade his people, to correct them, but woe be to the nation that goes against God's people. God might use a nation to do that, but then God will punish severely, severely punish the nation who puts his hand against his people. The best thing for you is don't put your hand against them and don't put your tongue against them. They are our beloved enemy, our beloved enemy. They're enemy for the gospel's sake, but they are still God's people. And just like, look, let me give you an example of this. Uh, those of you who have kids, imagine, imagine if I walked into your home, saw your child do something, and rebuked your child in front of you, and went out and, and told your child, reprimanded your child for doing something, you know, with you standing right there, how would you feel about that? I think some of you would probably be taken aback and a little shocked for a second, but then you eventually say, whoa, 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 preacher, whoa, you know, this is my home, and yes, you're our preacher, but you don't. You don't, this is not your area. You stay out of this. That's what's happening when you go against Israel. You are sticking your nose in business that doesn't belong in. You let God be the one to deal with them. But if I were you, I wouldn't put my tongue against them. Uh, you, that's be, and if you do, if you do, that's between you and God. And trust me, he'll deal with you. 
All right, let's go back here to the text. Or a railer, or a drunkard. You know what a drunkard is? <laughs> Nowadays, it's an alcoholic. <laughs> so they, it's, a, it's not a drunkard. That's what the Bible calls it. The Bible, the Bible doesn't make it pretty. Because sin's not pretty. All right, let's use the modern-day uh, terminology. Those of you that were alcoholics before you got saved, uh, was it pretty when you were laying there in your own vomit? Was it pretty when you were hugging the side of a toilet, making all sorts of promises you would never do that again? Sin's not pretty. It's not pretty. All right, let's continue. Or a drunker or an extortioner. Uh, extort, uh, to try to get something out of somebody by, uh, by, by uh, just almost like, tort, like torture, like trying to, like trying to uh, uh, well, you know what extorting is? It's like blackmail. It's like trying to get somebody to give you something. Uh, by threatening them. I was reading Dr. Ruckman's commentary, and he mentioned this word extortion, and he said, uh, he said I'll give you an example of this, and it's done in pulpits all across the country. <laughs> he says, uh, preachers will stand up there and say, you better give, you don't give, God's going to get his money one way or the other. And he just starts, he starts land blasting preachers for trying to extort the money out of the people. He said, look, it may be true that God's going to get his money one way or the other, but if you're trying to put your people into fear to get the money out of them, <laughs> uh, woo. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, you know, we don't think about, we just think, oh, I'm not, you know, and we immediately pass this thing off, but I guarantee if you were to go ahead and start looking at and examining your heart about these things and taking it slow, and going, you'd start to see how you're walking the line on some of this stuff. All right, let's go back. With such a one, know not to eat. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> here's the problem. <laughs> How are you going to separate yourself? Because that's what the thing is. Uh, that's what it says in the end of verse 13. Therefore, put away from among yourself that wicked person. So look, uh, there's, uh, you're, you're pretty much not going to find a New Testament church uh, today that's strictly a New Testament church. Uh, you might be as close as you possibly can to be in a New Testament church, but to find a, somebody a strictly New Testament church... <laughs> Let me show you what I mean. How, wh what, if we, what if we put out everyone here who is covetous? <laughs> what if we... <laughs> some of you are already starting to walk towards the door. <laughs> what, what, I mean, uh, you see what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I know people talk about having a pure church and, and, uh, and, 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 we're gonna, and, and, and we want to do church discipline. That's what this is, church discipline. Catholics call it excommunication. All right, so let's say we're going to do church discipline. <laughs> Let's say I brought you in. <laughs> I found out that you were, uh, I found out you had an idol. <laughs> and, uh, and I brought you in and I said, now, brother, or sister, you have an idol. <laughs> and uh, you, and uh, so I'm going to, we're not going to eat with you. And we've already brought, uh, I've already come to you uh, by myself and I brought two and now I'm going to bring you before the church and we're going to kick you out. You know what's going to happen. As soon as I do that, you're going to immediately turn around and say, yeah, but do you know what so-and-so's doing? <laughs> And next thing you know, it's going to get real nasty. <laughs> now, I'm not saying just live and let live and, and whatever, you know, is happening. If there's a sin that's affecting the church, you better believe it that we're going to deal with it. And I have in the past, and I want to tell you that it's not fun. So I had a guy, I had a guy who was uh, shacking up with a bunch of girls, and I didn't know about it. And then all of a sudden, when it came to my attention, I met with them. And I said, look, you're going to stay away. Because you obviously are not repentant about this, because I found out I'm not the only one who told you. And you're obviously not repentant about this thing, and I'm going to tell you right now, because the influence you have, you ever come back around this church, I'm going to stand up in front of the church, I'm going to tell everybody what you've been doing. And you left, you never came back. All right, so I understand, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal, that's a big deal. And I'm not saying the others are not a big deal. So here's the best way to handle this stuff. If God ever calls you to preach, here's the best way to handle a lot of this stuff. Preach the word. If you will preach the word, and you will preach it as it stands, I'll tell you what, the word of God will go out there and start to hit people, and they're either going to get right or they're going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, what, that's probably one of the best ways to handle this. Yeah. All right, by a show of a hearty amen, how many of you have ever come under conviction during any preaching that's ever been done here, myself or anybody else who's preached, and you got right with God, and you are so thankful that the Lord just dealt with you through preaching <laughs> and not just some brother having to come up to you and say, hey, you need to get right. <laughs> So that's the best way to do it, is preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. The other thing I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you don't, don't stand up and use the pulpit against people. Don't do that at all. That's not right. That's not right. Don't do that. 
Um, people will use it for petty matters. But I'll tell you what, if, if you, <laughs> I guarantee, I, I've, I've had some of you come up to me and say, man, preacher, it sounds like you knew exactly what I was doing last week. <laughs> But it's because if you'll just preach the word, then the Holy Spirit will deal. Because I had no idea that, that they were going through anything. And the Holy Spirit will just deal with somebody. Amen. All right, he says, for what, uh, verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? So do I have anything to do to judge them that are without? He answers it in verse 13, but them that are without, God judgeth. So the lost folks, God's going to take care of that. So verse 12, the end of the verse, do not ye judge them that are within? And so he tells them in verse 13, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So the Lord's going to deal with the lost folks. The church needs to deal with matters here within our church. So now he brings us into chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, dare any of you have a matter against another? Go before the unjust and not before the saints. Look how many questions he asks. Do ye not know the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Here's a, man, this church is a real spiritual church, and he's, at, like, he's asking these questions because they don't know. They don't know. How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. It is, is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Such spiritual people as you are, you don't even have one wise guy among you? Not being a wise guy, but you don't have anybody who's wise among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, this is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. All right, so you can see he reads, really, uh, I mean, reads in the riot act here. And this has to do with treatment uh, and, uh, between brothers in Christ and not being able to work out differences. You should be able to work out differences. If you're saved, husband and wife, you should be able to work out differences because you've got the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Bible says only by pride cometh contention. Yeah. You should be able to work out differences here within the church. I guarantee you're not perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you, every single one of you, myself included, you're not perfect, and you will offend somebody one day. <laughs> Just give it time. You'll do it. And you won't even mean to do it, and you'll do it. Yeah. You know what you hope? You hope they have mercy on you. They hope they, for, you for, they forgive you. Yeah. I said, you hope. You know what you want? You want them to be gracious with you, so be that with them. Yeah. Uh, I find that Christians today, they get upset over the most petty things. Ah, uh, you know, you didn't shake my hand. You didn't. Uh, you didn't greet me. You didn't. I mean, what? Who knows? Or what are you? Uh, you moved. You moved uh, this from th this side to this side. That's why you know. Uh, you know, uh, I, uh, churches have gotten in fights over the color of the carpet. I know you guys laugh about that, but I mean, let me ask you: Aren't most of the fights we get aren't they kind of laughable? <laughs> you ever gotten in a fight with your spouse, and then you kind of going back and like, what well, exactly were we arguing about again? <laughs> All right, now let's go here in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1. Dare any of you have a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So he's, he's how, how come, how do you even dare, those of you that are saved, you got a matter between you, you got a problem between you, and you can't even resolve it between yourselves, and now you got to go to a court of law before these lost people and resolve it there. Now, I understand that there are some things that we have to go to the courts for. We have to. Like, there are certain things you just can't get around. Uh, you must go to the court for those things. Uh, you can't have a marriage license without going to the court. You can't get a driver's license without going to the court. Uh, if you want to adopt, even if it's between two saved people, you have to go to the court. There are things you have to do. And sometimes, in certain cases, some Christians suing each other in court, and sometimes there's no other, leave you no other option. You've got to go to court, and you've got to get it settled. However, it should be, the best case scenario is it should be that Christians should be able to work out their differences between each other. They should be able to. Because, verse 2, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? You, you're going in front of lost people, and one day you're going to be their judge. And yet you're standing before them saying, hey, can you do us a favor? Can you please settle this disagreement that we have between ourselves? Because we are in, even though I'm going to judge you one day of the biggest decision ever, whether or not you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to judge you on that. I need you to judge this little petty matter. 
this little petty matter that deals with this life, I'm, I need you to help me, because I'm incapable of working this out between us. I'll, oh, but don't worry, the biggest decision uh, uh, ever that affects eternity, don't worry, I'm going to judge you about that one day. Take your Bible and go over to uh, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, this is when the world will be judged. Revelation 20. Re Paul's really putting it into perspective. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great wine throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is the final judgment. This is the final judgment before they go off into the lake of fire, which I guess you could, that would be the final judgment, uh, fire. But here they are at the great white throne judgment. This is the, the final judgment of the dead coming up. Now here they are being judged. We're not judged at this uh, judgment. This is where we are judging the world. How are we judging the world? Well, the judge is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you and I are called up as expert witnesses. Now think about that for just a moment. All of a sudden, here you are ministering to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he calls you up as an expert witness, and it doesn't matter who is standing there, whether it's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, your uncle, doesn't matter, and the Lord calls you up as a witness against them. I cannot even imagine what that's going to be like. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the tears are not wiped away until after this. In the next chapter is when the tears are wiped away. I imagine there'll be tears that'll shed, be shed there at the great white throne judgment. But at that time, we will have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God gets done laying it out and he judges everything, not only are we going to say amen, but the accused is going to say amen, you are right. And at that time, he'll say Jesus, and down on their knees they'll go and say Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. And off they'll go into hell. All right, now notice verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is them coming up to be judged, and in this final judgment here, and uh, there, the, the question is, is their name written in the book of life, or is it not written in the book of life? Now, the way I think the way the book of life operates is I think it operates like this. Everyone who's born, everyone who's given the life, their names go into the book of life. At the moment that person trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, that name is sealed in that book of life. And, but if they die without Jesus Christ, now they are no longer numbered among the living and their name comes out of the book of life. That's how I think that thing works. Some people think that once they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's when the name is written in the book of life. Either way, if you're saved, your name is in the book of life. And you don't have to worry about that. Go over to, if you look at Philippians chapter 3, you'll find that. Now, go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. So when they come up before the Lord, they are going to be judged. They're going to be judged. And we are going to be there ministering uh, to the Lord. Daniel chapter 7, and if needs be called upon, he'll call, we'll be called upon as expert witnesses. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose, gar whose garment was white as snow. So this is the Lord. And the, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set... Revelation 20, and the books, Revelation 20, were opened. So in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, that is the great white throne judgment. And notice there are 10,000, minute, thousand thousands are ministering to him. That's us. That's us. If you're saved, you're not judged at this judgment. Your sins were judged at Calvary. There's a daily self-judgment of your sins now when it comes to your fellowship with the Lord, not your salvation. Your salvation was settled at Calvary in the moment you trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior. It was applied to you. And then one day you will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and you will give account of everything you've done in your body since you've been saved. And then after that, your judgment's over. So at the great white throne judgment, the thousand thousands ministering to the Lord, that's us. That's who's doing it. All right, so go back in 1 Corinthians 6. So now that you know doctrinally what's going to happen, verse 2, do you not know the saints shall judge the world? 
Well, you don't know this spiritual church at Corinth. I mean, you church with all these gifts, speaking in tongues and, and healing, and all, you, all these gifts you have, and yet you don't even know this? You can't even do these basic things? Do ye not, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Drop down to verse 4. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. So these smallest matters, the matters in this life, they're small. They're small matters. The matters in the next life, those are big matters. Those are big matters. So look, if you can't judge these small matters, then just figure out in the church who is the least esteemed and stick that guy as the judge and say, hey, can you tell us how we ought to handle this and settle this disagreement between us? Amen. That's what he tells them. All right, now in verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. All right, we'll judge angels. Look at Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1. So ain't that something? So the Bible says that we're made a little lower than the angels. <laughs> Uh, and yet one day we're going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, he's higher than the angels and then one day we're going to judge angels. Okay, so, he, so even though that might seem far off now, it's going to happen. Hebrews 1 verse 7, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now angels are not born, they're made. God made them. And they were made uh, back... Uh, uh, there you read jo Job 38, it tells when he was making the foundations of the earth that the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. And in uh, Revelation it tells you that, uh, that those seven stars are seven angels. So the angels were created, they were made, uh, they're not born. And so when they, when they were made, they were made back there uh, before creation. And when God is uh, make it, forming the foundation of the earth, they're shouting and praising the Lord together. But after seeing God in all his splendor and all his glory, go to Jude. Go to the right to Jude. After seeing God in all his splendor and all his glory, Jude verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate. Their first estate was, was, was perfect. It was pure. It was good. It was there with God, and it was a holy thing. They, left not their, they kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So they're going to be judged one day, the judgment of the great day. And we're going to be there, and the only place I can see where this is going to take place is going to be at the great white throne judgment. And when the Lord brings up the, the, the folks there at the great white throne judgment, there, it appears that angels are going to be brought up as well, and we'll be judging them there. Now, that's quite a powerful thought to think about. So that's what our destiny is. That's what our destiny is. We're going to be, that's a pretty high office there. That's a pretty, that's a big responsibility. You can't work out differences. You can't, you can't work that out between you and another brother or sister. Do you not realize what you're going to do one day? If you need help with this, just find something in the church you think is least esteemed. And say, hey, look, we can't work out our differences. Will you help us? <laughs> and that's what Paul says, how to work that thing out. All right, now uh, you'll notice, you'll notice that if you'll just stay in the book and just preach the Word of God as it's to be preached, as it says there, it'll help sort out a lot of these, these things and things that I don't even know anything about and uh, I don't really care to know about. But what the Lord will do is the Word of God is pure, and it'll go out, and it will help. That's how our church is going to be pure and stay pure, is if we are stay yielded to the Word of God. Amen. All right. Manny, why don't you close us in prayer?